Calling case number 17-CB-5895, California versus Trump. Council, please step forward and state your appearances for the record. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Gregory Brown for the State of California. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Nimrod Elias for the State of California. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Samuel Siegel for the State of California. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Sarah Winslow with the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I have with me James Burnham from the Department of Justice Civil Division for the federal defendants. We also brought with us today Kelly Cleary, who's an attorney with the Department of Health and Human Services, should the court have questions that are more for HHS than DOJ. And we have a housekeeping question sure. that we'd like to ask. So Mr. Burnham will be doing the, the argument for the federal government, and he has some documents which were exhibits to the House of Representatives amicus brief, which he'd like to put on the Elmo during his argument. Is that okay? Sure, yeah, and no you. problem. If you, if you feel the need to do so, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Good, and, and then uh, we have a bunch of people appearing by phone, right? Yes, and listening in via court call are attorneys for the state of New York, the state of Illinois, the state of Rhode Island, U.S. Department of Justice, the state of Massachusetts, the state of Oregon, the state of Minnesota, the state of Washington, the state of Kentucky, counsel for the U.S. House of Representatives, Office of the General Counsel, and the state of Connecticut. Okay, um, I think uh, what, I'll, what I'd like to do is start with the state. Um, so why don't you uh, come on forward. You feel free to relax until it's your turn to, um, to speak. Um, so to get a preliminary injunction requiring uh, uh, that the administration make these payments for the next few months while we adjudicate the case, um, uh, one thing you have to have is st strong legal arguments, strong arguments that you will win at the end of the day. And we can talk uh, a little bit later about whether you have any strong legal arguments. But I, I want to start with the issue of harm, because even if you do have a strong legal argument, you also have to show that uh, if I don't issue a preliminary injunction requiring these payments to be made, that there will be a significant amount of harm. Um, and the harm has to be fairly immediate, right? I mean, there are some arguments in the briefs about harm that may occur in 2019, for example, right? How the exchanges will be affected in 2019 or 2020. Those questions can be dealt with at the end of the case, right? We can set up a schedule where this case gets adjudicated pretty quickly and I issue a final ruling one way or another. Um, and uh, what it, if you win at the end of the day, the relief, I can, presumably order relief that will address you know, the problems that you contend would exist in 2019 and 2020. So I think really the question is why should I be ordering the administration to make these payments in the next few months while we get the case adjudicated? What harm will occur in 2017 and 2018 if that preliminary injunction is not issued. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, the immediate pressing harm really turns on the fact that open enrollment begins on November 1st. And what we're looking at right now is a very chaotic system where, I believe it was 11 days ago, it was announced that these CSR payments are not going to be made. And what that's doing across the country is it's causing chaos for states and for their consumers who are going to need to be made. But I, I, I guess I, I, don't, I don't fully understand that because as I understand it, states like California and most of the other states who are plaintiffs in this case saw the writing on the wall a long time ago, right, that um, the administration was going to terminate these payments to insurance companies to subsidize uh, uh, co-payments and, and deductibles. Right? I mean, it was, I believe it was like December of 2016 where there were court filings in D.C. indicating that 
uh, the, the incoming administration might uh, take the position that these uh, payments are not um, permitted under the law as it currently exists. And states like California, seeing the writing on the wall, put together a plan for how to deal with it if the administration terminated these payments. And it seems like California is actually doing a really good job of responding to the termination of these payments in a way that is not only avoiding harm for people, but actually benefiting people, right? I mean, let me, let's, let's just walk through it for a second, okay? Number one, these payments, uh, the, the federal government is no longer making the payments to the insurance companies, but the insurance companies are still required under the Affordable Care Act to subsidize the co-payments and deductibles for the customers, right? So the, so the patients are still getting the subsidies. It's just that the insurance companies are paying for it, not the federal government, right? Is that right? Um, that, that's correct. Okay. Cut off, yes. and, then, and then the problem is that the insurance companies are losing money as a result of not getting these payments. But California and many other states is allowing uh, the insurance companies to increase premiums to make up for the loss resulting from the termination of the CSR payments, right? Correct. Okay. And California and other states have devised a uh, very clever way of, of allowing the insurance companies to increase their rates to make up the shortfall resulting from the termination of the CSR payments, right? You have on these exchanges four types of, four basic types of plans, right? You have the, the bronze plans, the silver plans, the gold plans, and the platinum plans. And as the names imply, you know, there are different qualities of, of coverage, but they all, they're all insurance plans, right? And as I understand it, what California has decided is that it is only going to allow insurance companies to increase their premiums for the silver plans to make up the, sh the shortfall um, resulting from the administration's termination of the CSR payments. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, and so, uh, as a result, the sticker price for the plans, the silver plans, will change, right? The sticker price of the premiums will go up for the silver plans, for the bronze plans, the gold plans, the platinum plans, the, the premiums are not being affected um, uh, as a result of the termination of the CSR payments, correct? That's correct. Okay, and then, but with the silver plans, the interesting thing is that the tax credits under the Affordable Care Act are tied to the silver plans. More specifically, if you are purchasing insurance on the exchange and you have an income level of between 100 and 400 percent of the poverty level, you qualify for tax credits and the amount of tax credits you qualify for is directly tied to the second cheapest silver tier plan on the exchange in your geographic area, correct? Second highest, I believe. Second cheapest. Second cheapest. It's the second cheapest. Um, and so as a result of the premium increase in silver plans, the, the tax credits for people purchasing insurance on the exchange who qualify for tax credits will go up. And so as a result of the tax credits going up, and as a result of the fact that the bronze plans and the gold plans and the platinum plans are not changing as a result of this, somebody who's purchasing insurance on the exchange will be able to buy a silver plan for no more than they otherwise would have had to pay 
because their tax silver plan rates are going up, but their tax credits are going up correspondingly. And they will be able to buy bronze and gold and platinum plans for less because their tax credits have gone up and the, the premiums for the, for the bronze and the gold and the platinum plans have not changed. So as a result of California's innovative response to the administration's decision to terminate the payments, and as a result of the fact that California saw the writing on the wall and planned ahead for this, and already established rates on the assumption that the administration was gonna terminate the payments, most people are gonna be better off, who are, most people who are purchasing money on the exchange, right? Um, I, we agree a significant number of people will be better off, but there are also going to be a very significant number of people who will be harmed. For example, most... Wait a minute. So I just said that most people are going to have an opportunity to get the same or better coverage on the exchange than they otherwise would have. Is that a correct statement or not? For 2018. Have to, I don't have the precise numbers in terms of whether it's most and how much, but certainly we agree a large number of people are going to benefit from the increased tax credits. And, and they're still going to, and those who, who, who buy but, plans that have cost sharing reductions are still going to get those cost sharing reductions because the insurance companies still have to give it to them, right? Um, correct. The insurance companies still have to give them. The, the real issue here with the harm is certainly some people will benefit from the rising premium well, tax credits. Well, I mean, credits, but you're being, but you're, being large, you're, 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 you're being a little bit slippery. You're saying some people will benefit. Correct. Isn't it true that the large majority of people in California who purchase insurance on the exchange will either see no increase in premiums or a decrease in premiums as a result of California's response to the decision to terminate the CSR payments? Um, again, I, I don't know the, the precise numbers. Okay, well, let me, read I, you, I let me read you a paragraph from California's press release, okay? Uh, Covered California issued a press release on October 11th. When was this lawsuit filed, by the way? October 13th. October 13th. So on October 11th, which is, was two days before the lawsuit was filed, and maybe even before the administration announced that it was terminating the CSR payments. I'm Correct. not sure. Maybe it was the same day. I'm not sure. But, but, Ca but Covered California issued a press release. And let me read the, the press release to you, or the, para the applicable paragraph of the press release. Because the surcharge, that is the premium increase that results from the decision to terminate the CSR payments, because the surcharge will only be applied to silver tier plans, nearly four out of five consumers will see their premiums stay the same or decrease since the amount of financial help they receive will also rise. And then those who do not get financial help will not have to pay any premium increase. So Cal Covered California put out a press release two days before filing this lawsuit saying that four out of five people purchasing insurance on the exchange will either benefit or see no increase in their premiums. And you're coming in here to court and arguing that there will be this tremendous harm that requires an immediate preliminary injunction to force the administration to resume these payments. Can you explain that to me? Yes, well, they, this concerns the other 20%, and that's still a very significant number of people. For example, consumers who do not qualify for the premium tax credits and who have been buying silver plans are going to see their rates go up. They that's not true, and that's not what this press release says, because consumers who do not qualify for the premium tax credits, because of the way California has responded to the threat of these payments being cut off, consumers who do not qualify for premium tax credits, if they choose to buy the same silver plan on the exchange, they would have to pay higher premiums, but, but California has arranged it so that they will be able to get a almost identical silver plan off the exchange that will not um, have increased premiums. So there's no harm to the person. First of all, the primary concern is for the, the low-income people who have difficulty getting coverage. 
at the people who, who make between 100 percent and 400 percent of the federal poverty level. And we just talked about those. Your response was, well, what about the people who are higher than 400 percent of the pro poverty level who don't uh, qualify for tax credits, premium tax credits under the Affordable Care Act? But the answer to that is the only change they need to make, they could go buy a bronze plan on the exchange, they could go buy a gold plan on the exchange, or they could go buy a, a, a silver plan comparable to the one they had last year on the exchange, but buy it off the exchange. And they won't suffer the premium increase that's being made for the silver plans on the exchange. So, so it sounds like those people aren't being harmed either. Do you want to try and explain to me, number one, who is being harmed, and number two, how you could say that overall in California, the project for providing health care to low-income people is being harmed? Um, uh, California has done a lot to successfully mitigate these harms, but... Um, then why did you file a lawsuit? Are we here? Why well, did you, or, or putting aside why you filed the lawsuit, why did you m seek a preliminary injunction to get these apparent benefits undone? Um, we, we have nationwide figures that show that approximately 2.1 million people who do not qualify for these premium tax credits will suffer from having higher rates. We have experts showing in, what are those, in many other what are states. The, where, where, where do those figures come from? Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the, the source of that 2.1 figure. Um, I can look that up. Um, you know, we yeah, have, look it up. I okay. want to know where it's from. Your Honor, that, that those numbers come from CMS, the, the report of, of how many people do not get the, the premium tax credit. They purchase these numbers. Looking nationwide, Wait we have how many? What? What? So, what is your figure? How many people, and what are and and who are these people? Um, who are they? They're they're the people who are their incomes are high enough that they do not qualify for premium tax credits. Okay, and, and so they're going to be affected, and it's 2.1 million. That's okay, a nationwide so are you saying number. That are you saying that 2.1 million people nationwide purchase insurance on the exchange who don't qualify for tax credits? Is that the number Correct. you're giving me? Yes. Okay. And in California, those people will be able to either get a bronze plan or a gold plan on the exchange, or they will be able to get a silver plan off exchange for the same price that they paid last year, basically. Right? Correct. But they're also just... Um and, and there are a number of other states where that is the case as well, right? That the, the, a number of other states, first of all, I believe that around 40 states in the nation anticipated this problem in advance and responded to it in the way that we're talking about here, right? That they arranged it so that the companies could only increase premiums for the silver plans, which would correspondingly cause the tax credits to increase and would, would preserve a number of options on the exchange for people to utilize, right? Like 40 states in the nation. And I believe most of the states who are plaintiffs in this lawsuit. Right, there are quite a number of states that did not increase the rates, and they're going to have their rates changing with, um, with open enrollment coming up. Um, you know, Massachusetts, Maryland, D.C., Vermont, Rhode Island, all set rates. Actually, I think Massachusetts uh, in, uh, did the same, did a, something similar to what you all did. But, uh, they're looking to see whether they can increase theirs, but I, my understanding is the current state of affairs is they have lower rates that they will need. I think, they've annou I think they just announced recently that the way they're going to deal with this is by allowing rates for the silver plans to increase. So in other words, the way that basically the way that California has done it. Right. And frankly, I'm not sure why any state would do anything different, right? I mean, there are a couple states who are plaintiffs in this case, um, Delaware, Kentucky, who for some reason have not chosen to respond to the termination of the CSR payments in this way. And it seems to me that the states, by choosing to respond in a different way, 
are the ones who are responsible for depriving their citizens of the opportunity to get higher tax credits to, to buy uh, insurance on the exchanges. Well, I guess some states saw that there was uncertainty and took very proactive steps to plan in advance, but I don't Most think states did. I don't think other states should necessarily be punished for not having known that this would happen. The thing I don't understand is now you've pivoted away from California because you don't seem to have any argument about how the overall sort of health care reform project in California is being harmed by this. And but you represent the state of California. So you're coming into court seeking a preliminary injunction to reverse it back to the way it was, which will then deprive, according to, to Covered California, will deprive a large number of people, um, a large number of low-income Californians from getting a better deal than they got last year. Um, there are significant harms just from the, the uncertainty and chaos coming into open enrollment and the informational gaps for consumers who need to change plans, et cetera, are being subject to a different set of standards than they were subject to last year. Um, have the well, why, why, can you explain to me why anybody who qualifies for tax credits on the exchange needs to change plans? Um, Give me an example of somebody who qualifies for tax credits who would need to change plans on the exchange as a result of this. Um, there may there may not be specifically, but I, I think the the uncertainty that this injects into the system and what's going to happen going forward is going to I think it's going to spook consumers. It's certainly spooking insurance companies, and I think one of the core concerns here is that insurance companies may start dropping out of these markets. And there's extensive expert testimony. Has we any have insurance that company dropped out of the markets in California? as a result of the termination of CSR payments? Well, the, the termination only happened 11 days ago. Or the threatened ago, termination? Yes, as a direct result of the threat, Anthem pulled out of, I believe it was 16 out of 19 California markets um, this year. So we have seen insurance and Anthem companies. Anthem is a very big insurance company, right? That's correct. But a very small player on the markets, on the, on the exchanges, right? Right. But and Anthem is a very relatively insignificant participant in the exchanges in California, correct? Um, I, I don't know the exact numbers on that, Your Honor, but I do know that, that they pulled out and they have stated that one of their core reasons for pulling out was the uncertainty having to do with this, these cost-sharing reduction payments. Right, but all the other insurance companies worked with California to uh, figure out a way that they could recoup the costs through premium increases, and uh, the, the way they structured the premium increases, it's, it seems like it's going to, for the vast majority of people, it's either not going to hurt them or it's going to benefit them. So I, I want to give you one more chance to try to explain why the state of California has come to court seeking to change the status quo while this litigation is pending. Um, again, there, there are tremendous uncertainties from the, the change, the abrupt change in the CSRs on the verge of open enrollment and the concern is, from the point of view of insurance companies, that's going to change how they look at the program and how their their willingness to participate. Granted, in, hey, but the, in other the states, open it's enrollment going to be is much happening. More. Open enrollment is happening November first, right? Correct. And it has already been communicated to the people who are who might buy insurance on the exchange what the rates will be, right? Correct. Correct. And uh, those rates took into account the the and the anticipated elimination of the CSR payments, right? Correct. So you're seeking an injunction that will require um, new information to be disseminated to people at the 11th hour um, who might purchase uh, insurance on the exchanges. And, that, and by the way, that new information will be, oh, by the way, remember how you were going to be able to buy that gold plan for less than you, than you had it last year? You're not going to be able to do that anymore. Is that, you think that will clear up the confusion um, that exists in the exchanges right now? Uh, well, in California, we won't be able to do anything before the open enrollment, but what we, what we can look into if the system is... Could I, could I um, ask a question about that just mm -hmm. before I forget? I, uh, 
ha happy to let you make your point, and, and let's try not to forget it, but I, I just have one important question. Um, you say that California can't do anything um, before open enrollment. So what you're saying is that if I order the administration to resume payment of these, uh, resume these CSR payments, the insurance companies will be able to both collect the higher premiums that were established in anticipation of termination of the CSR payments and collect the CSR payments from the federal government? Is that the result you want? Well, that's what I was getting to, that okay. when they're able to, once the, if, if the system is stabilized with an injunction that requires the, the maintaining of the status quo, which is the payment of these CSR payments as they've been paid for nearly four years to allow sort of an orderly resolution of the legal issues, if we, if we get that stay and we can provide insurance companies with assurances of stability, we can then look to our, towards moving forward with reducing rates and, and continuing the system as it would have been if these CSRs had been, had been guaranteed throughout. So, so that, that's sort of a, a, a complicated way of saying what you want to happen now and for 2018 is for the insurance companies to double collect. Um, again, but it, it's, what, what we're looking to do is to, to mitigate the harms from the uncertainty. And if they're able to double collect temporarily, certainly down the road, we will be able to, to look into going back and, and adjusting rates appropriately but that's gonna take time. That's not something we can do overnight, so we can't guarantee you that we're gonna fix that in time for open enrollment. In fact, I think that would be virtually impossible, but what a preliminary injunction now would do is it would stabilize the system, stabilize the markets. We would know what's, how it works, how the system works, and what's happening. Insurance companies would understand, and then the state regulators can go in and look and determine what needs to happen to the rates. We're certainly not looking to give insurance companies a windfall, but we're also looking to make sure that the system is stable and that there's certainty in the system. And that certainty is very important for insurers. And this is, this is a business that really requires you know, looking at their actuarial tables, what money is coming in, what money is going out, and making these adjustments is very disruptive to that. That's led many insurance companies right, but it, to, but, to pull but, out of various markets. Well, we uh, have but, but, but again, you know, maybe this is kind of a good lead-in to a discussion of the merits, whether you have any strong arguments on the merits, because, again, we can, you know, work quickly to get a final adjudication of this case, right? So the question, the, the, that's why I said at the outset, the question is only whether I should issue an order requiring these payments, like for the next three or four months, until we can adjudicate cross motions for summary judgment and I can decide who wins, right? right? So, you know, of course, like, it's important to have stability in the markets, it's important to have certainty, um, but, and, you know, particularly long term, you know, the, there are, you know, principles embodied in the in Affordable Care Act that need to be uh, adhered to. And, uh, you know, the Affordable Care Act is all about providing exchanges that will be stable and will provide meaningful health coverage to um, people who don't get it through their jobs. Um, and, but, but we're, right now, we're just talking about what would happen in the next three or four months. And I just don't understand, like, the confusion you're talking about and instability. I don't understand. I mean, it seems to me that California and the insurance companies have worked together to anticipate this and have operated under the assumption that it would happen, which is makes sense because it seemed fairly clear that it would happen and nobody was shy about saying that it was likely to happen. So um, uh, the reverse course now seems like it might create further instability, at least for the next three months or so. Um, I, we disagree with that, and one, I, I think it is important to look at the, the other states who have, have done things differently than California. Okay, give me an a, a example. Lot of them. Give me an example of how it works in some other state. Um, I mean, if, if for example, the state of Washington is looking at two separate rates right now, and here we are, I believe, nine days away from the open enrollment period. My and understanding so, is that Washington has already made the decision to go to silver, like California has. I, 
I'm not sure if they've made it, made a final decision. I believe they may be waiting to see what, what happens, happens here today. Okay, so they can, do, they can their... so Washington can do that, right? right. I mean, let, and there are some states, I'm not sure if Washington is one of them, but there are some states that may need to, may not have done enough planning ahead, right, and may need to scramble to allow insurance companies to increase their rates, and they may need to figure out how to allow insurance companies to increase those rates. For example, I understand Maryland, they had a hearing this morning on the topic of which, which option to go with. <coughs> well, Maryland can go with the California option, right? right and that will, that will uh, uh, it, it seems to me, uh, number one, uh, prevent a lot of people from being harmed, and number two, benefit a lot of people. So why not just go with that? Well, the problem is they can't do that overnight, and they can't disseminate the information to people in an effective way that's going to prevent the, the chaos that's going to happen to their markets from you know, these potential either increases either right on the verge of open enrollment, assuming they can even get it done, or potentially after open enrollment, because otherwise, if they can't make the change prior to then, then they're going to either be faced with insurance companies threatening to leave because they're taking, taking big losses, well, when was when was when when did the administration announce that it was terminating these payments? I mean, it was it like it was October twelfth? October twelfth. Twelfth, and what is it today? Twenty third, I believe. Okay, has, has any insurance company announced that it's withdrawing from the twenty eighteen markets um, between the eleventh and the twenty third? I'm not aware of any who have announced in that eleven day period. But again, we have precedent for quite a few earlier this year because of the uncertainty announcing that they were dropping out of the 2018 markets. Um, we have experts telling us that they think it's quite likely that more will drop out because of this. We have a, a CBO report saying that cutting off these CSRs is going to result in approximately one million people, um, one million more people going without insurance. Yes, but in do, you, do you know why the CBO report predicted that um, um, a million more people would go without insurance. Do you know what okay. the basis of that prediction was? It was that insurance companies would, would withdraw from the markets, and that hasn't happened. Right. And the reason right. that hasn't happened is because states like California have found this innovative way to respond to the termination of the payments. And so the CBO prediction that a hundred more mil sorry, that a million more people would go without insurance is outdated and it's based on an assumption that has not come to fruition. And the reason it hasn't come to fruition is that states like California have found an innovative way to respond to this, this issue. Right, but even, even if states like California have done a lot to mitigate the problem, we're still talking about quite a large part of the country that is, that is facing immediate and irreparable harm. For example, there are 1,472 counties with only one insurer any of those counties have their insurer, insurer drop out, they're going to become what's called a bear county. And yeah, but, but, but those insurers have already are, have, have been planning on participating in the exchanges for 2018, and between October 11th and October 23rd, none of them has announced that they're dropping out, right? But that's a very short window of time, and there's a lot of uncertainty. I but think. open enrollment starts November 1st, right? Right, but a lot of those insurers, frankly, may be waiting to see what happens here today. A lot of them, maybe, I, I think an insurance comp a large insurance company is not going to make an overnight decision like that. They're going to need to look at the numbers, see what it looks like going forward. Okay, now in those counties, in those counties that have only one, where there are regions, or, or excuse me, in those geographic regions where there is only one insurance company participating in the exchange, how many of those regions are in states which did not respond to the threat of um, termination of CSR payments by allowing the insurance companies to raise the rates for the silver plans? Um, I don't have a precise breakdown at my fingertips. My understanding is that the, these counties are, are scattered around the country, so they're in, in many different states. Um, I believe it covers roughly half the country, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, so it's, it's a huge portion of the country that, that is under threat. And again, we don't know exactly what, which insurers will drop out and where, but we have a lot of experts telling us that there is a very significant and real risk that multiple insurers will leave. And I, I think 11 days is too short of a time to say, gee, there's no problem here, no one's going to leave. Well, but then come back when, if people start announcing that they're leaving. 
I mean, things are going well in California. Nobody has announced since the termination of the payments that, uh, that they're leaving the markets, and you've come in here and, and asked for a preliminary injunction. Again, we, because we think that stability is, is crucial to ensuring that those insurers stay in the market okay. and that anything, the options are there Anything else on um, sort of the, the question of whether the absence of a preliminary injunction would cause significant harm? Anything else on that issue? Um, I, I believe we've, we've covered our points. Okay. Um, anything you want to say? Let me ask it this way. On the merits, why doesn't the administration have a better legal argument than you? I mean, we have, we have the, the tax credits established in Section 1401. We have the CSR payments established in for, Section 1402 of the Affordable Care Act. Section 1401, the tax credits, um, was codified in the Internal Revenue Code, right? 26 USC Section uh, 36B, right? Yes. And the cost-sharing payments were codified in the Health and Welfare Code, I believe it's called, right? 42 U.S.C. Section 18071, I think, okay. right? Um, and the Appropriations Bill, the Permanent Appropriations Bill, is for tax refunds, and that's at 31 U.S.C. Section 1324, is that right? Correct. Okay. And the ACA added 36B to the appropriations, permanent appropriations bill for tax refunds and did not add the cost sharing payments, which are not tax refunds, to the permanent appropriations bill for tax refunds. Why should we conclude that there was a permanent appropriation for um, cost-sharing payments in 31 U.S.C. Section 1324, namely the statute permanently appropriating money for tax refunds? Uh, because the, the refunds due from Section 36B um, are clearly intended to encompass the cost-sharing reductions. If you look at the statutory structure, the premium tax credits and the cost-sharing reductions are part of a very integrated, uniform, unified system of, of subsidies to ensure that there is affordable uh, health insurance available. And if you look at the, the cost-sharing reductions, to be eligible for the cost-sharing reductions, you first have to be eligible for the premium tax credits. Um, if you look elsewhere in the statute, um, it, they use the term credit to refer to them both collectively. They're intertwined, I believe it's 45 or something, different provisions. But the, where they but are the fact, I mean, you say they're intertwined. I mean, <clears throat> I think probably the better way to describe it is that the, the, the two provisions, Section 1401 and Section 1402, are mentioned together 45 different places in the ACA, right? The tax credits and the um, cost sharing reduction payments are mentioned together. Um, 45 different times in the Affordable Care Act. But each time, with maybe one possible exception, each time there is a, seems to be a pretty clear recognition throughout the Affordable Care Act that the tax credits come from 26 U.S.C. Section 36B and the cost sharing payments come from 42 U.S.C. Section 18701. Did I get that right, 18701? Uh, is it 071? 071, sorry. Right, but there's this constant recognition throughout the statute that the tax credits come from one place and the cost-sharing payments come from another place. 
and the, uh, the, that the tax credits come from one statute, one part of the code, the United States Code, and the cost sharing payments come from another part of the United States Code. And so they, the, the, the part of the United States Code where the tax credits come from, they put that in the permanent appropriations bill and the part of the United States Code where the cost sharing payments come from, they didn't put it in the permanent appropriations bill, which by the way is a permanent appropriations bill for tax refunds and the cost sharing payments are not tax refunds. So in light of the constant recognition throughout the Affordable Care Act that these payments, these expenditures come from different sources of the United States Code, why should we assume when they, that, that when they referenced one portion of the code in uh, the permanent appropriations statute, they also meant to, uh, they meant to include the other portion of the code? Uh, I think when you look at the, the structure and design and purpose of the ACA, it's clear that these are meant to be, be viewed together as part and parcel of a single subsidy. I mean, the fact that they're pieced out in different codes um, doesn't really answer the question of did Congress, what did Congress mean well, with the permanent appropriation? Well, part and parcel of the same subsidy. I mean, I, I, will, I, I will grant you that the subsidies were designed to work together. I mean, there's, it doesn't seem to be much doubt about that. And it does seem, at least superficially, just a little strange that Congress would permanently appropriate money for one subsidy and leave the other subsidy to the vagaries of the annual appropriations process. But to say that they are one subsidy, I mean, isn't that a little bit of an overstatement? I mean, there are two subsidies that work together um, to accomplish the goal of providing health care to people on the exchanges, right? That's right. It's two subsidies that work together. But again, I think the question is, getting back to you know, what did Congress intend with that uh, appropriation, we, we believe it's clear that it, Congress intended to cover them both because of how they work together, because of how they are, are, are integrated. Um, the fact that you cannot get the cost sharing reduction unless you are first eligible for the premium tax credit, we think it is very significant. And um, another thing I would point out that elsewhere in the ACA and numerous other places where things were subject to an annual appropriation requirement, Congress was pretty explicit about that. Here, if, if we so say- What you're saying is there's, there, for, for all of the parts of the Affordable Care Act where Congress intended for the program to be funded annually as opposed to permanently, Congress specified that in, this, in the statute, is what you're it saying. Did. I, I don't know if it did for everyone, but it, it certainly did in numerous places throughout the ACA. Did, are, what, are, what are some examples of other ones that, they, that Congress did not do that for? Um, and I apologize, I, I can't remember pr the particular provisions offhand where it, it did not do that. But I think what it shows is, is that Congress typically in the ACA, it said one way or another which way, if whether it was gonna be. Typically, but not always. Safe, but not always. Right, um, okay. But here we have a permanent appropriation that certainly looks like it was intended to apply to these subsidies. Um, looking at the design and purpose of the ACA, it, it would really make no sense for it not to be. Um, to, to put the, have these CSRs subject to an annual appropriations requirement is really going to create chaos in the system. We get them. It, it, it certainly, I mean, I, that, you know, you, th those are reasonable arguments. Um, but might the answer simply be that the drafters of the legislation, I mean, this is not to, this is not, meant to denigate, denigrate the drafters. I mean, I, I can't imagine how difficult it was to be involved in the drafting of that legislation, to be a lawyer for the Legislative Council's office on the Hill, trying to, you know, put that legislation together as Congress was negotiating it, you know, at a furious pace and things are changing rapidly and all that. I, you know, this is not meant to denigrate anybody who was involved in the drafting process, but there, because it was such a chaotic drafting process. There were a lot of mistakes in the Affordable Care Act, right? There were a lot of drafting errors. And I guess the one question I have is, um, why, why, why shouldn't we just assume that the drafters forgot to deal with this? 
the, that the reason there is no permanent appropriation for uh, the cost sharing payments and the reason there is no authorization for an annual appropriation for the cost sharing payments is that the drafters in the chaos just forgot to address that. And if, and if that is the right way to think about it, what are the legal consequences of that? Um, right. Two-part response. One, I, I don't think they forgot. I think they placed it in 1324. Um, so, but assuming that they did forget, um, I think the consequence when we look at King v. Burwell is we, we shouldn't read these drafting errors out of context in a way that really undermines the fundamental operation of the statute. But King v. Burwell wasn't a drafting error case, right? Or at least it wasn't by the time it got to the Supreme Court. I, I seem to recall that when it was in the lower courts, um, lawyers were arguing that there was a drafting error involved. But by the time it got to the Supreme Court, nobody was arguing that it was a drafting error, and the Supreme Court certainly didn't, con didn't um, treat it as a drafting error, right? Right. And it, I, I think King Rivera is on point because, again, what we're looking at is a statute that there, there's a plausible reading when you take certain language out of context that might plausibly be read one way that would really undermine the statute, and there's another plausible reading that is consistent with the statute, and I think that's exactly what we have here, is that the, the permanent appro appropriation under Section 1324 uh, is meant to apply to the cost-sharing reductions, and where you have... The struggle that I have with that, I guess I have two struggles with that. One is that in King versus Burwell, the, the court sort of undertook a two-step analysis, right? The first step was, okay, this language, um, ta you know, people get tax credits when they get insurance from, the ex from, the, from an exchange established by the state, um, seemed clear in isolation. But when you view it in the context of other statutory language, it became ambiguous because if you, if you read it that way, it would render nonsensical other provisions of the Affordable Care Act, right? And so only when, they, when the court found an ambiguity based on an examination of the statutory language did it turn to the purposes and say, we're gonna resolve that ambiguity um, by saying, by, by adopting the interpretation that is, the only interpretation that is consistent with the purposes of the Affordable Care Act, right? I mean, now is, you agree that was the analysis that, that the court yes. took in King versus Burwell. So I, I understand the argument that not providing an, a, per, a permanent appropriation for these payments seems in tension with the purposes of the statute. I don't think it blows up the, pro the whole health care reform project like it would have in King versus Burwell, right? And California's innovative response to the termination of the cost sharing reduction payments is evidence of that. But, um, but I, I do, I guess I, I, I agree with you that it seems the absence of a permanent appropriation seems in tension with the purposes of the statute but that's the second step of the analysis, right? The first step of the analysis is, is this provision placing the tax credits from 36B into the permanent appropriation bill, uh, sorry, into the permanent appropriation statute, the statute for permanent appropriation of tax refunds, can you, is that really ambiguous, such that you could interpret it as also including um, uh, the, the, the cost sharing reduction payments and that's the part that I'm not getting. I mean, I, the, you know, how do you, what other language in the Affordable Care Act do you look to to make your point that this language about the permanent appropriation is ambiguous? Right, I mean, the, the language itself talks about, you know, refunds due from Section 36B. Well, what does it mean to be from 36B, then I think we need to look at 36B and what what falls into that box. And when you look at 36B and how it interacts with 18071, um, that these are all part of the same subsidy program. And again, looking at the structure of the act and how these are closely related and how they interact, 
we, we believe it's, it's quite clear that Congress intended, even if they could have articulated it better, but that they, they intended. Um, I, I don't think it's fair to say that that language What's you know, your favorite provision? Point me to a provision in the Affordable Care Act. Which, give me your favorite provision that would be rendered kind of nonsensical or meaningless um, if, uh, if the permanent appropriation language were read in the way that I'm suggesting. Um, just for, for one example, there's the, uh, the abortion restriction provision that would, that would render that duplicative um, if it were read in this way. Um. I had a question about that. Um, is, is one possible explanation for the inclusion of the abortion language, notwithstanding the fact that Congress slaps the Hyde Amendment onto appropriations bills every year, that, well, you never know when the Hyde Amendment is going to stop getting slapped on appropriations bills every year? So we're going we're gonna to have this language, this abortion-related language, um, to make sure that regardless of whether Congress decides on a year-by-year -year basis to slap the Hyde Amendment onto appropriations bills, we're going to have the protection in the ACA. Um, that, that may be a plausible reading. I do think that the much better reading is that Congress understood that it was providing a permanent appropriation for this reading. I think that that other reading kind of involves multiple steps that I'm not aware of any legislative history or anything that would indicate that that's what Congress was thinking. Um, yeah, but there's no legislative history indicating Congress was thinking one thing or the other on this issue, right? I believe that's right. In the short time we've had, I, we haven't been able to look at it exhaustively, I confess, but I'm not aware of any. Um, and then just looking back at, at 18071F2, that, again, that's provision that says to get a cost-sharing reduction you need to first be eligible. Um, 18071. 1F2. And that's where you need to first be entitled to a credit under, under Section 36B. And it specifically mentions 36B there. Yeah, let me, let, me, let, me, let me focus on it just to make sure, since it's one of your favorite provisions, I want to make sure I, I read it. It's a, it's a hard sentence to read. Hold on a second. Okay, so in other words, that what that says is, is you can't get cost-sharing reduction unless you also get tax credits. Correct. And, and we believe that, again, it, it cites 36B by name, and it, it's in the cost-sharing reduction provision. Again, we believe that is further evidence that Congress did intend to tie these together in such a way. Um, again, in statutory interpretation, we're ultimately trying to get to congressional intent, and we have structure, purpose, I think, are quite clear. The, the language of 1324 is ambiguous as to what is meant by from Section 36B. And when you look into 36B, when you look at 18071, that these are really quite integrated part of a really a single overarching subsidy program and and I think it's quite clear that Congress's intent was to have this be a permanent appropriation they've taken other actions to indicate that again they didn't include any language indicating this would have an annual appropriation and it would really undermine the system to have this be an annual appropriation you have insurers who need to set their rates every spring and they're not going to know typically until October or later whether that's happening I mean that that is going to be throw chaos into the system every single year. Isn't that, isn't that just sometimes true of federal programs? I mean, it's, it's not an ideal way to do business, but isn't, it, isn't that just sometimes true of federal programs? For example, Medicaid? I mean, doesn't, isn't Medicaid an example of a program where it's an entitlement, right? or I don't know if, I, the word entitlement I've, I used to use that word loosely when talking about the budget process, and as I've studied this case, I've gotten the sense that the word entitlement is actually kind of an imprecise word. But um, there, there, is, um, there is a mandatory spending requirement for Medicaid grants to the states, right? Congress is, 
the federal government is required to provide Medicaid grants to the states. And yet, there is no permanent appropriation for that, right? There's an annual appropriations process. And so every year, Congress appropriates money for Medicaid to provide grants to the states. And the states and providers um, are, and insurance companies are spending money on the assumption that the money will be appropriated. And in fact, Congress has, consistent with the law, appropriated money for Medicaid every year, right? And so part of it is, is you know, part of the question is, is this really such an abnormal way of doing business, right? Requiring the federal government to spend money but not making a permanent appropriation, requiring instead as, assuming that Congress will appropriate it every year, and then people spend, you know, make expenditures out there in the world on the assumption that Congress will, in fact, appropriate the money. Um, I, Congress has done that in certain contexts. We believe in this context of the CSRs, it, it really would be kind of crazy. It doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense because of why, how. Why is it more? Why is it crazier than in the Medicaid context? I mean, it's hard to th think of a more important federal program than Medicaid. Right, I, right. You would think that if Congress, you know, this is about providing health coverage to really low income people, right? Lower income people than those who are getting insurance on the exchange. And, you know, I mean, the, the failure to provide money for that program would be catastrophic. Yet, Congress did not make a permanent appropriation for it. It, it, uh, just sort of assumed that everybody would operate on, on the assumption that the appropriations would be made annually, and the appropriations have been made annually. Why, why is it goofier in this context than in Medicaid to not have a permanent appropriation? Um, I, I think because it's this, it's this one particular small piece of, of a larger subsidy plan that, that has a permanent appropriation, and um, you know, why Congress did what it did in the Medicaid context, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I haven't looked into that. Maybe they feel like there's significant political pressures, et cetera, that, that it, it's fine to do it that way. In this case, we're talking about this one small piece and requiring it to have an annual appropriation just purely because of the timelines annually of when the insurers need to, need to set their rates and when the budget process happens. It just, it really makes no sense. There's a massive disconnect in the sense that you need to set your rates and the insurance industry. Again, you know, we're talking about private insurance here where they're gonna be crunching numbers and looking at actuarial tables, things of that sort. Um, it really does throw the rate setting process in, into a bit of turmoil when there's that much. I didn't assume all of that would be true with Medicaid um, as well, but I, but I haven't had enough time to dive into the ins and outs of Medicaid or, uh, or into the ins and outs of other programs that may operate in a similar fashion. Anything else? Um, anything else you want to um, uh, mention before I uh, invite uh, the um, administration to, to speak? Um, I, I would just emphasize. I mean, what, what we are seeking here is preliminary injunctive relief to preserve the status quo um, as it's been for nearly four years, including eight months under the current administration, under which these CSR payments have been made monthly under a permanent appropriation under Section 1324. Um, and we believe that, that injunctive relief is essential to prevent chaos and harm to the markets. Um, and there are, there are many states where those harms are going to be, are certain to be quite acute um, with the open enrollment period coming, coming up shortly. Um, and there's a ton of evidence that just the chaos and uncertainty of that injected into these markets is going to have detrimental effects that are likely to be um, irreparable, such as insurers leaving. Again, we have past evidence of insurers leaving specifically because of, insur uh, of concerns due to the CSRs. I think it's extremely likely that we're gonna see more, and we ask this court to issue injunctive relief to prevent those harms, to allow this case to be litigated in an orderly fashion without chaos in the markets while this case is being litigated. Mr. Uh, Mr. Burnham? 
you've come all this way. Um, I'll give you a chance to Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, some of these questions. James Burnham on behalf of the United States. Uh, I have come all this way, but I actually don't have anything to add unless the court has questions. Well, I, I have maybe a couple of questions on the merits. I don't Certainly. think I need to hear anything more on the harms issue. Um, question that's been nagging me throughout the weekend, and it may be a goofy question, but I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, and I was reminded of it because you have um, counsel for CMS here. I can't, I'm sorry, what, what was uh, Kelly Cleary, Your Honor. Cleary is here. Um, you know, there, there was this um, litigation a couple of years ago, I guess, relating to the Affordable Care Act. And um, I haven't had a chance to really educate myself on it yet, but I, I guess there, w there was the, the, the Affordable Care Act required the federal government to fund w what was called these risk corridors, right? And I guess the risk corridors were, this is sort of period of time when insurance companies were entering the exchanges and the, the, the federal government was uh, kind of using, was providing some sort of almost buffer or insurance for the insurance companies to make sure that it wasn't too costly for them to enter the exchanges or something. I may have described that incorrectly. Like I said, I haven't had time to dive into it yet. But I think the upshot of that dispute was that it was determined that there was kind of a general fund in CMS um, to uh, that that CMS could use to pay uh, that money for the risk corridors. Um, and like I said, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I was curious, I mean, might there be an argument that the money that Congress has appropriated for that, that CMS fund could be used to, f could be used and therefore must be used to, to fund the cost sharing reduction payments. So uh, let me answer your question or respond this way. There's 37 cases pending right now in the Court of Claims and in the Federal Circuit over the risk corridors issue that Your Honor just raised. Um, I am not the legal issue has not been resolved. Yet. Not 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 resolved. definitively. So some federal some of the courts of claims have gone in the federal government's direction and said no payment is uh, required, <clears throat> and some have gone in the insurer's direction. And I think the federal circuit will have to sort that out. And For the on the risk corridor. Yes, sir. Okay. And so I I think that is a useful analogy to this situation because if there is an argument like the one your honor identified, which I have not seen made yet, no, I am certain not. an issuer will show up soon to make it. Uh, and we will be able to then litigate with that issuer over whether that issuer is entitled to some payment. And I also think for a lot of reasons, this is a more practical way to deal with the problem because as your honors identified, this is a very big, very complicated market in which a lot of states like California have done really you know, innovative and impressive things to kind of make it work uh, in light of what's happened. Um, and, if and, an issue you, and, and by the way, you agree that the way states like California have responded to this is perfectly legal, right? I, I, I don't know of any reason why it's not. I guess I, I can't commit on behalf of the United States definitively, Your Honor, but I have, not, I have no reason to think there's anything wrong with what California's done. And if it is better for its citizens, then obviously that's a good thing for everybody. Um, but what I was gonna say is that if, if the issuers who are not getting money under this program come into the Court of Claims under the Tucker Act, that will provide the federal government an opportunity to point out, well, gee, you know, you actually made your money back in six different ways. And so maybe you didn't get a CSR payment, but you've gotten another payment, it nets out to zero, or even you've gotten more. So, you know, it's just a much more nuanced and particularized adjudication than this court can do on a nationwide basis. Well, I mean, I, I suppose theoretically, I mean, this is, this question would be posed uh, with respect to a preliminary injunction or it would be posed with respect to the, you know, the judgment at the end of the case, even if no preliminary injunction issued, right? I mean, if I ordered that 
fi at the end of the day, I determined that the states have the better legal argument and that the ACA does contain a permanent appropriation for these CSR payments or there's some other appropriation for the CSR payments and therefore the federal government is required to make the payments because the Affordable Care Act states that the federal government is required to make the payments. Um, couldn't I do that sort of reconciliation in, in this case as well? Or, 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 or enter a judgment which made clear that that type of reconciliation would need to be done? I think if at the end of the case, Your Honor, could, we could probably talk about a way to do it if that was where the court was inclined to go. I think that would be hard to do on a preliminary injunction basis. So I do think at the end of the case, if the, if the court determines that these payments are appropriated for and thus mandatory, uh, I'm sure we could figure out a way to implement that ruling in a way that is orderly and doesn't deprive the taxpayers of more money than should be done. But I haven't thought through yet how to exactly do that. Um, what about, I wanted to ask you, I forgot to ask um, uh, the states this question also. Uh, I want to talk about the role that Section 1301 plays in this, the statute that says that, um, I, I'm not remembering the exact language as I sit here, but it's something along the lines of, um, Con if Congress is going to appropriate money, it has to be done with clear language. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the, the, the other side argues that, that that does not apply to, and I guess the, way, the we might describe your argument as, okay, Judge, you cannot engage in the type of exercise that the court engaged in in King versus Burwell because um, uh, looming over all of this is Section 1301, right, which says that you cannot conclude that Congress made an appropriation unless it made a, a clear statement that w it was appropriating money, right? Their response is, no, 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 we, that doesn't apply here because we know c clearly Congress did make an appropriation and this question is just about the scope of the appropriation. And so this, this sort of clear statement rule contained in 1301 does not overlay the inquiry. And I, I, I was curious about your response to that. So uh, my understanding is that that is not, that is not settled yet as a matter of, of court-made law. I, as I understand it from my friends at the Office of Management and Budget, the executive branch's view is not different, is the same as the states in insofar as the clear statement rule goes to creation, not to scope. Okay. So I think the clear statement rule is very important here in saying that 1402 does not itself create an appropriation, right? So 1402 says spend the money, that's not an appropriation. Uh, I also think it's, it's helpful in, in understanding that when, I mean, it's sort of a funny question, what does it mean to create an appropriation? It clearly created an appropriation for 36B. I would, I would reject the notion that this is a question of scope because I would say it created an appropriation for one program and not the other, and that there's really not a question about whether 36B is both. So, so another, another way to put that, and tell me if I'm misinterpreting your, sure. your argument, but it sounds like another way to put that is 1301 doesn't matter because this language oh, yeah. is clear, in the Affordable Care Act is clear that um, uh, there is a permanent appropriation for the tax credits, and there is not a permanent appropriation for the CSR payments. Yeah, absolutely, Your Honor. And in fact, there was one phrase that I think really is sort of the, the knockout punch for clarity, and that's in 1324B. It actually says, and I'm quoting the statute, disbursements may be made from this, the appropriation made by this section, quote, only for the listed programs. I, I think that's, I think that's, that's pretty clear. Uh, and so I don't think you even need to get into the, the sort of overarching question about the scope of appropriations. I also don't think this is like King, because I think the point in King was that the Affordable Care Act does not, there was not a poison pill in the Affordable Care Act that kills it. Uh, and, and here, this, that's not the situation, because I think the Affordable Care Act Congress probably reasonably assumed to the extent they did think about this, that future Congresses would pony up and appropriate money for this program just the way they do for Medicaid, as your honors noticed. It, it, did I, did it, was I correct in the way that I described 
the Medicaid program and how it works? <laughs> I am, I, as far as I know, uh, Your Honor got it right. Uh, you're certainly correct as far as an appropriations matter, which is what I've looked at here. And you're certainly correct that there are lots of people and entities and other folks with heavy reliance interests on that program continuing, as there are for all kinds of things. The and that's, and, and I will tell you right now, for, you know, going forward for the, you know, as we consider, you know, I assume there'll be cross motions for summary judgment at some point. That is something I want very detail, a very thorough education on. Sure. Is what other programs, you know, are, are like this and potentially like Medicaid, um, where, you know, there is a mandatory expenditure, but annual appropriations and where lots of people out there rely on, in advance, on the annual appropriations taking place. Um, and, and, and so like a thorough education on how Medicaid works. Um, if I'm right, if I'm right that Medicaid is an example of a plan that, of a program that works that way, you know, identification of other programs that work that way and a thorough education on those programs. Yes, Your Honor, we're happy to provide that. Okay, anything else? Not for me, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Any final word from the states? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I would just emphasize that um, the nationwide harms in, in other states are very significant and are uh, a valid ground for a preliminary injunction for the irreparable harm we seek, even if Your Honor is not convinced that but, there's... But, but, but somewhere between like 40 and 45 states have chosen to respond to this by increasing only silver premiums which as we discussed before, results in people getting much higher tax credits, the federal government spending more money on tax credits than it would have spent on CSR payments, but in any event, people getting more tax credits and having either the same or better options um, for insurance for uh, 2018. Um. Points. Somewhere between 40 and 45 states, and almost all the states who are plaintiffs in this case. So you, ref you're, you're, you make this kind of ephemeral reference to nationwide harm, but you haven't explained what the harm is in any concrete terms with respect to any particular state. Right, I think just to give you some numbers, uh, Pennsylvania, for example, has said their rates are going up. I believe it's about 30%. For which type of plan? Um, I can't recall off the top of my head, I believe it. Because the, the, the fact that rates are going up totally begs the question, right? Totally begs the question. Because if rates are going up in Pennsylvania for the silver plan, which I am 99% sure is the case, if rates are going up 30% for the silver plan in Pennsylvania, then what that means is people are gonna get a much higher tax credit and they're gonna be able to buy the bronze and the gold and the platinum plan for much less than they otherwise would have they're gonna be able to get the silver plan for the same price. The, the, the timing of that is very significant because with open enrollment coming up on November 1st, consumers are not gonna have clear information about what their options are and what they're getting. So you're gonna have consumers And how is it gonna become in. more clear if I enter a preliminary injunction saying, oh, by the way, you, um, you know, your, your tax credit's going down? Um, because I'm requiring the administration to resume these cost-sharing payments, and as a result, that 30% increase in the silver plan will not be happening, and as a result, people's tax credits will not be increasing. And I know that you've been looking at the Pennsylvania version of Covered California website, and you thought that you were going to be able to get a bronze plan for $50 a month less than you could have gotten it last year or a gold plan for $50 a month less than you could have gotten it last year, but sorry, that's not gonna happen because we're gonna restore these cost-sharing reduction payments. Well, what's gonna happen is there's, because this is happening, again, on the verge of the open enrollment period, the, the information is not gonna get out to consumers in time, and we have a, the Families USA amicus brief. Information about the injunction that you um, want me to well, issue? No, the information about how these, the, the plan rates are going to change and how some consumers may be able to, been may be able to benefit. Ahead. Pennsylvania has been planning ahead for this. But so the change would be if I issued the injunction. 
and therefore Pennsylvania would have to change plans again, right? Um, I, I believe that if the injunction is issued, what the states can do is that they can start implementing the lower rates that are, are more in line with what they would have been with, with the CSR payments. And so these states so that are looking at- So keep the same rates and, and, and then require the federal government to pay, make the CSR payments to the insurance companies so that the insurance companies benefit both from higher rates and CSR payments. Higher rates that were imposed in anticipation of the elimination of the CSR payments, they get to keep the benefit of that and they get to collect the CSR payments from the federal government. Right, but that's just a step on the way to allowing the states to, to mitigate the problem and set the rates back where they should be in an actuarial place. But we can't even take that step if the CSR payments are stopped. We're stuck with these, these higher rates. And a lot of states, um, again, it's uh, at least five states that have set their rates based on an assumption that these payments will be made, they're gonna have to make late adjustments either right on the verge of open enrollment or after open enrollment and that's going to cause chaos we have the, um, the amicus brief from the families usa really laid out all the problems that happen um, in the in the real world for consumers when they can't get good information a lot of people just walk away but can't get good information i mean the the state of california is standing on the courthouse steps um denouncing the president for um taking away people's health care when the truth is that California has come up with a solution to that issue that is going to result in better health care for a lot of people. So to the extent there's chaos and confusion, I wonder how much of it is California's fault for not uh, singularly focusing on communicating to people properly that this actually creates a potential benefit for them. I mean, I and California should be applauded for taking steps early on in this year to to see this coming and take steps to mitigate it. I don't think it's right to, in fact, punish the states who saw this coming. I think what we are seeing here is with this abrupt cutoff. But, but, but that's what an injunction would do. It would punish the states who saw this coming. Uh, we, we disagree with that, Your Honor. I mean, we, we believe that continuing the CSR payments will stabilize the markets keep insurers in those markets in a way that is going to allow more people to keep their insurance and, f and fewer people to go without. Again, it's due to the, the rising rates and the, the very real risk of insurers dropping out of markets, and that's what we're here, that's what we're concerned about, and that's what we are asking this court to prevent. Okay, I understand the arguments. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'm planning on, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm aiming to issue a ruling tomorrow. Uh, I suppose there's a small chance that it could slip over to Wednesday, but I, I, I think it's likely uh, that I'll be able to issue a ruling tomorrow. Thank you.